Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Charlotte Pitt. I am the manager of the Denver Recycles Program and the Denver Compost Program. Um, we are a program of Denver Public Works, part of the city and county of Denver. And um, we are primarily responsible for providing waste services to single family homes up to seven units within the city and county. Um, we, uh, we offer a lot of special services around recycling and composting. So I want to give you a little bit of background this evening or this afternoon um, about where we are in Colorado, what we're doing, what we're doing in Denver, and then sort of finish up with some things that you can do to help. Um, I'm not a huge speaker, so I'm probably not going to fill the whole 20 minutes. Um, so I love to answer questions, so, so keep that in mind as I'm going through this. Um, I'll fill the rest of my time with any questions that you have. Uh, where we are. So the city and county of Denver right now in 2015 recycled and composted about 18% of its waste. Now keep in mind that is only the residential sector and not the commercial sector. Um, it also doesn't include uh, large multifamily buildings over seven units. A um, couple of things that we offer through the city are obviously waste collection services, uh, bulky item collection. We have an every other week recycling program. We have a very limited access composting program right now. We only have five trucks on the street in Denver and we service about 10,000 homes. Um, and to put that in perspective, we have 176,000 homes available to service. Um, and then we also offer a lot of special services. We provide re waste and recycling services and some composting to Denver Public Schools. And we also service a large majority of the municipal facilities, the branch libraries, the central library, rec centers, um, pretty much everything except for so some of the larger public venues. Um, we have a 2020 sustainability goal. Um, that goal is 34% by 2020. If you'll remember, our rate was at 18%, so we are not quite there yet. Um, and this goal, this 2020 goal, really just gets us to average. So for um, all of the green efforts going on in Denver and Colorado, waste as a whole is one of the things that we struggle with. Um, it's not just a Colorado and a Denver problem, it's actually sort of a Rocky Mountain West problem. Um, and there are a couple of reasons that has we've sort of fallen into that. It's not as urgent as everything else is, um, which we kind of disagree with, by the way. Um, and I'll tell you why afterwards. <laughs> um, a couple of things that really haven't spurred a lot of interest in waste diversion in the region as a whole. Um, one, we've never had a, a landfill crisis. You know, the East Coast, the West Coast, you saw the garbage barge in the 80s off the coast of New York. You've got um, community on the West Coast who are driving their waste 150 miles one way. Um, we've never had anything like that happen. We have um, a lot of land on the eastern plains of Colorado. Um, we also have this amazing heavy clay soil in our state that means it's really cheap to open up a landfill. Um, we don't have to put in high-priced synthetic liners to meet federal regulations or state regulations, um, and that allows disposal costs to stay low. Um, to put that in perspective, in Denver, we pay about $16.21 a ton to dispose of waste. If you go to the east or the west coast or central U.S., you're usually looking at anywhere from $35 up to $100 a ton. Um, so incredibly low landfill disposal rates, which makes it hard for things like recycling and composting to compete. Um, we also have fairly close landfills. Um, transportation is not a major challenge. Our round trip uh, to the landfill and back is about 40 miles, um, so nothing super extensive. And because of some of those reasons, because we've never had a, a crisis, there's been a very sort of hands-off approach, very little leadership at the state level. Um, a lot of states around the country have state mandates. They require cities and local governments to meet certain goals. Um, we don't actually really have a state, an official state goal at this point. Um, so no state mandates. Um, and because of all the cheap disposal, there's really been a, a struggle to invest in some of the infrastructure that we need for, for waste diversion, recycling, and composting. 
Um, it's not all dire though. <laughs> we have lots of opportunity. Um, we know what we throw away as a municipality in the residential stream. And what we found is 75% of what's in there is good stuff. Now we have already a really robust recycling program. Given all those barriers that I just talked about, um, we have a voluntary subscription-based recycling program in the city and 80% of eligible residents have opted in for no other reason than it's the right thing to do. There's no economic incentive for them. There's no mandate or requirement. They've, they've taken the step to call and say, hey, I want a recycling bin. Um, and they've done it simply for the right reasons. So we think that's pretty good. Um, where we see huge opportunity is obviously in that 50% organic stream. And that's where we're working to roll out and really um, raise awareness about the, the positive benefits of composting. Um, here's what we're doing as a city organization to try to drive a little bit more waste diversion in the city. Um, one of the things, it may seem like a small thing, but we've been working for the last four years to standardize our trash collection system. Um, up until now, we've had three different collection systems in the city, depending on where you live, one of which was a dumpster system, um, which created an incredible amount of illegal dumping and really a lack of accountability around waste waste disposal. So we've been working for the last four years to implement a cart-based trash collection system um, and really try to create some awareness and accountability for each household around what they're creating, what they're disposing. Um, and even though we haven't taken away really any capacity from those households, the perception that we've taken away capacity has, bit, has been big in the community. Um, we have seen, as we've been rolling out that program, a, a big boost in um, recycling signups too. In the first neighborhoods we rolled it out in, we saw about a 13% increase in, in recycling signups in those neighborhoods. Um, we are working on rolling out composting. Um, we right now have five routes on the street. Um, and we have about 10,000 customers. We have two trucks on order that are expected to roll out two additional routes in January. And then we have just been um, budgeted for another four routes. So essentially we're doubling our capacity from this year in 2017. Um, so we'll be able to add hopefully another at least 10 to 12,000 homes to the service. Um, we have also, now that we're at an above 80% participation level in the recycling program, we have decided to sort of get out of the subscription business. Um, and as we're rolling out trash carts around the city, we're automatically delivering recycling carts to homes that don't already have them. Um, we are looking at developing a number of drop-off centers. We opened our first recycling drop-off center last year at our Cherry Creek Transfer Station. I've got a flyer out there about it. Um, and we're seeing about three to 400 people come through that facility every week. So we're looking to open a central drop-off site with hopes of having higher participation. Um, we offer a number of special services. Um, this is leaf season, obviously, so we have our leaf drop program going on. We generally collect about 600 tons of leaves from Denver residents um, over a, a three week weekend or three weekends in a row. Um, we offer household hazardous waste collection services. Um, in the after Christmas, we pick up Christmas trees. Um, we do electronics recycling. We've hosted paint recycling events, um, a number of opportunities for, for the community to participate. Um, and I have a list of those outside. If you haven't seen them, we've got a nice little magnet with all our services. Um, so we feel like we have some pretty robust services. Um, getting the word out and getting people to use them is probably one of our biggest challenges. And what we found through the residential recycling program when we were subscription-based is neighbors have a huge influence over other neighbors. Um, and there's definitely that sense of sort of keeping up with your neighbors. So. Um, when I want to talk about things that you guys can do or things that residents can do to help us, um, first of all, if you live in a composting neighborhood, I highly encourage you to sign up for composting service. 
Um, even though we have really good participation in the recycling program, um, we think we're still missing on average about 20 to 30% of the recyclables from each home. And that may be because there's not a recycling bin in the bathroom or the upstairs of the house, or there's not a, a recycling bin in the office or the basement. People would typically do a really good job in the kitchen and the living room and the main living areas, but maybe not in those peripheral rooms. So fully utilizing the recycling program. Um, obviously, spread the word. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is um, the investing in infrastructure. Um, it's really hard to compete in a city where there are lots of lots of things that are important to people you know when people are complaining about potholes or special services you know if you feel like this is important to you certainly speaking up to your elected officials is hugely valuable for us um, we also have an online recycling directory. We have over a hundred items listed that we don't collect in our programs, but we know that there are businesses in the community that do um, collect those materials. It's a great resource. Um, we get a lot of questions. What do I do with propane tanks? What do I do with my old baby gear? What do I do with wine corks? We have all of those listed on our recycling directory. Um, certainly, we encourage participation in the special events that I mentioned. Um, uh, we also offer, in partnership with Denver Urban Gardens, we have a master composter training and outreach program. That's a volunteer program, train the trainer program. We do 40 hours of intense training, and then we ask for 40 hours back in community outreach at places like farmers markets, um, community events, neighborhood events. Um, we have a series of waste reduction tips on our website. Um, obviously, we're entering the holiday season. On average, Americans generate about 25% more waste between Thanksgiving and New Year's every year. And I, I'm pretty sure you know why. <laughs> um, but food waste, packaging, um, things like that. Um, and then we do dabble a little bit in social media. Uh, not great on Twitter, but we have a great Facebook page. Um, that's a great way to stay in touch with all of our latest news. Um, and also, sh you know, the opportunity to share with your community and your friends and your neighbors. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jasmine Barca. I'm an outreach coordinator for EcoCycle. Uh, they're a zero waste um, nonprofit based in Boulder. So this year is actually our 40th anniversary, so I'll go through a brief history of um, the NGO. So it started in 1976 with a group of volunteers who provided one of the first ever curbside recycling service. And as you can see, we started out with repurposing old school buses as the, um, as the pickup uh, cars. Now, 40 years later, EcoCycle does all of the environmental education in Boulder County. We're strong advocates for zero waste policies. We operate the Boulder County Recycling Center and have the first in the nation Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, or CHARM, where you can take yoga mats, bicycles, appliances, electronics, etc. Um, we've also switched out our old uh, school buses for actually actual like hauling um, cars, uh -huh. and we pick up recycle and compost for businesses, single family, and multifamily residences. Zero waste is one of the fastest, most cost-effective short-term climate solutions, and recycling is actually known as the climate solution's best-kept secret. That is because recycling is equal to energy savings. There is a ton of energy that goes into creating a material from virgin material. So an aluminum can, you need aluminum for that. But in order to make aluminum, you need a mineral called bauxite ore. So we go to different parts of the world, mine up this mineral. This mineral is then shipped off to Iceland where they process the mineral and make aluminum sheets. The aluminum sheets are then once again transferred all over to different like parts of the world and um, to be made into different products. So if an aluminum can is made, it not only takes a lot of energy again, but it also has to be um, transported to you, the consumer. So energy savings is actually equal to reduced greenhouse gas emissions, which is why recycling is such a key factor in the zero waste like, climate solution. So living zero waste has a significant impact. If we, as a nation, all had a 90% recovery rate and reduced our waste 
by 1% each year by 2030, we would have the equivalent of removing 80 coal-fired power plants, which is a huge impact. So what about Denver? As Charlotte told us, um, Denver's recycling rate is 18%, and we roughly send around 206,000 tons per year to the landfill. Our goal is to reach the national average of 34%, but we can do better. Um, cities like San Francisco are at 80% and Portland's at 70%. So this is attainable and achievable. So since the first Sustainable Denver Summit, EcoCycle has worked with a variety of groups to develop strong zero waste policies to help us reach the 2020 sustainability goals and build grassroots support. So what are we advocating for? Well, one of the things is free curbside compost service for all residents. So we um, helped get four more compost routes approved for the 2017 city budget. And now uh, the city will have access to compost service. Um, we still need to increase participation in uh, the compost service, however. So we would like to offer it at no additional charge. It's currently $10 a month, roughly $10. We would like to also reward recycling and compost and discourage waste. So part of what EcoCycle does is advocate for zero waste policies. We've helped cities like Lafayette, Louisville, Longmont, and Boulder switch to a pay-as-you-throw volume-based pricing system. Um, for the pay-as-you-throw system, you get charged less for recycling and compost and get charged more for landfill. So this incentivizes people to do the right thing and decentivizes people to do the wrong thing. We would also like to increase business recycling and compost. Businesses produce as much as 60% of the municipal waste. Um, Boulder recently passed a universal zero waste um, ordinance saying that businesses and multifamilies should have access to recycle and compost. Um, having this sort of access and bring these like businesses and multifamily units to uh, recycle and compost could double the recycling rate from 10 to 20,000 tons per year in Boulder. So the fourth and final thing is to require apartments and condominiums to provide recycling and compost. Many residents I've spoken with here in Denver are very interested and want to do the right thing. And this is actually an equity issue. Everyone should have access to recycling and compost. So our call to action is simple. Join our campaign to help Denver become a zero waste leader. Um, so at my table, I actually have a letter written to Mayor Hancock saying that we would like the following zero waste strategies implemented within the next two to five years. That is provide curbside, uh, curbside composting for all residents at no additional charge, reward recycling and composting and discourage waste, increase business recycling, and now, something new, require apartments and condominiums to provide recycling and compost. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal Froman Levine and I am the director of Reframe Creative Reuse. Um, we're now, we were Reframe Creative Reuse, we are now Reframe at MAC. So our mission at Reframe at MAC provide, is to provide an affordable creative reuse center and makerspace that engages the community by forging a path towards create creativity, sustainability, and educational alternatives through your donated extraordinary craft materials. So essentially what I'm saying is that we kind of want your trash. We don't want you to throw it away. You want it to, we want you to bring it up to us so we can upcycle it into art. Um, Reframe opened its doors in 2014, and um, it came to be because I had visited um, Portland, Oregon, where there is Scrap USA. I don't know if anybody, any of you are familiar with that. It's a huge creative reuse center that is open to the public, and I fell in love with them and their mission. So what I decided to do at that time is I brought it back to my school. I asked my um, principal if I could start a creative reuse center with my students. They were adolescents. They said yes. So we started it within the school and with um, about three months time we had enough art supplies to supply our entire community for around a year. And that was just from parent donations and the local communities around us. So we continued to do that for two or three years and then I decided we needed to take it out on the road. So this is when we opened up the nonprofit in Lakewood. Um, we opened up in 2014 and 
pretty shortly after we got a lot of the community involved and we received the 2015 Lakewood Sustainability Award. Um, we've shared our mission with and collaborated with TEDx at Mile High. We've been their exhibitors. Um, we work with FarmCAD, who is um, connected with REMCAD. It's the Rocky Mountain School of Art and Design. So we were partnering with them, partnering with some of their students to come in and teach classes and use our materials to teach them. Um, we've And we definitely, you know, we're always reaching out to small local businesses because they have a lot of things that they can give us that's interesting. We work with architects, always bringing us paint chips, things like that. So really reaching out to the smaller community. In July 2016, we were invited to partner with the Montessori Academy of Colorado, which was a win-win for me because I got a job there as an administrator and they loved the idea of the Creative Reuse Center, so we came together. So we are now housed at the Montessori Academy of Colorado and upstairs. Um, and the one reason that I'm so thrilled about this is, is that Mac, um, in general, is really supportive um, as an educational community. They're always wanting people to come in, nonprofits to come in and share their vision and their mission. So it really works um, for Reframe at Mac. Um, the, the thing that I think that I am most passionate about probably as an educator is our program, which introduces students to environmental education through the creative reuse of the materials that have been diverted clearly from the waste stream. Um, and the Makerspace provides the hands-on um, experience that incorporates these these following things. So we have the arts. We've just recently started for our students in-house an artist in resident program. So that means we bring artists from the outside into the community. They're professional artists and they come and they do four, six week, eight week workshops with our kids. But the catch is, is that they have to use the materials in the maker space. So recently we had a weaver come in. She's a fiber artist. She's Amy Clark Moore. She does beautiful work. She came in, she took the supplies off the shelf and she taught the kiddos how to weave in a six week series. Just recently, we finished up our workshop yesterday with a landscape architect. His name is Ian Anderson. He did the same thing. He came into our space, um, took the materials off the shelves, and the kids designed a streetscape for outside of the front of our building. So they were all out there yesterday, you know, writing with the chalk, and, you know, they have it all designed. Then what he'll do is he'll take those designs, he'll create a, a 3D model, a presentation, they will present it to our board, and then he'll come back in the spring and use some of the wood and the things that we've collected in the makerspace to you know actually bring it to fruition so it's a really cool thing for our kids um, the other thing that I love 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 doing are um, field trips we invite lo local schools into our community and what we do is I do a presentation on the following refuse reduce reuse recycle and then of course the state of air land and sea and the one thing that I do that I've realized in working with adolescents so long is that we've got to get them when they're younger. So I'm really starting to reach out to schools, you know, preschools, things like that. Let's get them started. Let's start the conversation. And then they pressure their parents into these things. And it's just a really cool, it's a great way to change, change the framework of how we look at it recycling. Um, I do look at landfills. And the one thing that I do in my presentation that I think is pretty powerful it's really simple and easy, is I've created this makeshift landfill made out of a fish tank, and it's completely full when the students come in. And then when we start talking about what refuse means, maybe we shouldn't be using plastic at all. I don't know. Or maybe we should reduce our use in plastic or reuse it. And by the time they get through this little presentation, the landfill is pretty much empty which we put it, once we put it in all those compartments. And then we get to do a really cool craft project out of old CD cases. So it's they love it. Um, the other thing that I really, really appreciate um, about our mission is that we want to reach out to adolescents. It's pretty easy for high schoolers um, to, to get out there and volunteer about a cause that they're passionate about. It's a little more difficult for the 12 to 15 year old simply because a lot of organizations um, don't want to take the risk by bringing them in to their organization. And we know young adolescents are a little squirrely. I have a passion for them. So we invite them in to Reframe at Mac. They actually come in. They support the artist in resident program. 
and they also support we we offer parties we call them upcycling parties birthday parties girls nights out you name it we offer it they come in and they support with those efforts so everything that they're doing when they're coming in they're pulling these things off the shelf so instead of you know nothing against michael's but instead of going to michael's you come in here and you do something a little different and it makes for a really great experience for the students because they get a lot of you know volunteer um hours under their belt and um it makes a great experience for us because i just like to partner with the kiddos so if i were going to ask in terms of a call to action for reframe it was definitely reframe the way you think about recycling and um, you don't have to hold on to your stuff there's places um, there's lots of little creative reuse centers out there there's raft out there that are willing to take your stuff and reuse it and in particular we want to use it for educational purposes and then reframe the way you think about volunteering you know you can come and actively participate with us or more than anything it's like we said there seems to be somewhat of complacency sometimes going on in 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 our region is spread the word about these things because a lot of people when i bring this up they're like what i have no idea you know they have no idea what i'm talking about and then again i mean come and join us we're open right now we're opening very slowly to the public um, we're open every third Saturday of the month, um, but you can come in and do your ho holiday shopping, anything you can dream up, make and take. Come in, you can wrap with newspaper. We have all kinds. You can get really creative, and it makes for a fun day out, as well as, you know, if you want to host a party or something, we're available to do that. So. Hi, I'm Chris Decay. I'm the Director of Education at Raft, and I think I know like half of your staff or more. <laughs> um, so we are resource area for teaching, and we take materials very similar to Reframe um, from corporate and or individual donors and repurpose them for use in education. Teachers on average spend around $500 per year to outfit their own classrooms. And we, if we had a money wand, we would totally alleviate that, but we don't. Instead, we have a warehouse. And so we take all sorts of stuff and reprice it to, at a better rate. We shoot to always be between 80 and 90% off. So we also have those self-proclaimed hoarders um, that come in and we, we'll unload their whole basement and turn it into whatever we possibly can. Outside, I have a few dim or some catapults that we use. We use wine corks too, all the time, um, to make educational materials. So we do catapults to teach force in motion or trajectory um, or the scientific method um, with the wine corks. But so we really do take almost anything to kind of answer that question of like, what do we not take? The giant binders is one of them. Three-inch binders are like my kryptonite. Um, we could build a whole building out of them. Um, so that is one of those things that we can't handle. There are a lot of other things. So we always encourage people to call and ask. There are a ton of things that we would just kill for. Um, butt rolls of paper is one of them. So if you know any large format printers, we want their paper. Um, yeah, butt rolls. It's the most tweeted thing in any sort of high school right now. Um, so, but yeah, so what we do is um, we are very similar to Reframe in that we do take this and it is very education focused. Um, we work with about 3,000 teachers where it's a membership based organization. So as part of that call to action piece, tell your teacher friends about us. Um, we will help save them as much money as possible. Our real mission is more about helping teachers and about promoting hands-on education, the recycling, the repurposing, the upcycling, that's how we achieve it. So we are, we are here because of the how, not because of our true core mission. Um, so that's one of our things. Just please do tell teachers, tell kids, we work with homeschool, before school, after school, resource area for teaching, not just traditional teachers. So please do let us know. Um, we do a ton of outreach about what we do because we, more than anybody, realize our stuff is weird. It is straight up bizarre. We get the factory remnants from making dog toys. So Kong is located in Golden. It looks like these weird mashes of rubber spider webs. And if you are a teacher and you're very used to 
very structured materials. It does not look like what you would get from Houghton Mifflin or from the Montessori catalogs. And so we teach a ton of workshops around how to use some of this stuff. And you can actually see that this is one of the examples that a teacher actually submitted back to us. It is a habitat teaching food, water, shelter, space. Habitat is a wonderful place. And this is the habitat the students made. There's yarn cones. The weird, these little foamy U-shaped thingies are the pads for making crutches. There's a company in Broomfield that makes custom crutches. So it looks like armpit shape because it is armpit foam. It just has not been armpitified. So, um, and so that's one of those aspects. And that's one of the things that we try to do is we try to really look at it with a critical lens to make sure it is going to be safe for students. Um, Tarumo BCT is located over in Lakewood. They make tubing for IV equipment. IV equipment from a hospital really gross. <laughs> IV equipment from the factory that makes it, pretty safe. So that's kind of a lot of what we try to do as kind of part of the service that we provide is we help to let teachers let some of their inner hoarder go and they no longer have to devote half their garage to toilet paper tubes. We have 29,000 square feet of space that we will devote to toilet paper tubes. <laughs> Um, and, and then we also are able to look at it with a more critical lens. Like we got a bunch of stuff from Hunter Douglas a month or two ago. They know we are looking for little plastic bits because they're awesome sensory materials. Um, and they found, or one of the people, their diversion specialist saw, saw them or saw what she thought was little plastic pellets. They look just like them, but they were fiberglass. Fiberglass, itchy, scratchy, and bad. Plastic, great. Um, and so we just, we had to get rid of it. It was, I mean, 50 gallons worth of little tiny fiberglass shards. Um, but again, it's better that we divert it and make it go to the great teaching supply closet in the sky as opposed to it going to the hands of kids first. And so that's one of those things that we always do. Um, we're open... Tuesday through Saturday. Tuesdays and Saturdays are our preferred donation day. We can make some exceptions. We were getting just totally inundated by the weird basement cleanouts of those self-proclaimed hoarders. So we had to say uncle and um, only do it on Tuesdays and Saturdays. So if you know people that are in the process of clearing out a craft room or cleaning out a basement, please send them our way. Um, we'll help them unload on Tuesdays and Saturdays. On any other day, we may say, can you come back? Or we may say, oh, this is awesome. We have a few minutes. We just are not staffed enough to be able to do that all the time. Um, but again, all the stuff that we take is on our list. It's the stuff that we take is sort of a, a list so long it's dysfunctional. So we kind of stop really trying to update it. And very similar to Reframe, we have a, we don't take list like binders and if I get another letter tray in my life I will have a come apart so that's about to go on that list <laughs> as well but any of those used office supplies we're generally very happy with um, used art supplies we're super happy with all those other just weird things like that's pretty cool too well we'll try it all once unless we think it's safe or icky um, and then we won't try it <laughs> Awesome. So thank all of you for coming so much tonight and a huge thank you to our presenters. Let's give them another round of applause. You guys were great. As Brenna said at the beginning, uh, my name is Jessie Lund. As of today, I also recently got married. Yeah, so congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So I want to let you guys know the event is far from over. We have the next 30 minutes scheduled for tabling out here in the hall, and you can hear already some folks coming in for conscious cocktails. So I encourage you all to hang out, grab a drink, and this is really your opportunity to connect with the speakers one-on-one. -on -one. If you had a question that we didn't have time for, or maybe you're just a little shy and didn't want to ask it in front of everyone, now is your time. Uh, you've, you've heard over and over again, love this place. And really the idea behind love this place is the fact that obviously all of us love Denver. We see how quickly the city is growing because of how amazing our quality of life is here. 
But we know that love in any relationship, whether it's a marriage or one that we feel for our city, you need action behind it to make it successful. And so that's really the idea with this event series, with this last portion that we have coming up, is to figure out if you have not filled out your action plans on your chairs yet, now's the opportunity to do so. So think through all the amazing resources that you learned about today and try to just pick out just one thing that's new that you can start doing, whether it's tonight when you go home, this weekend, or maybe even over the holidays. We've got a lot of great opportunities around waste reduction coming up there. Uh, with that, I will let everyone go, mingle, again, grab a drink, and hopefully you'll come back and join us for our last event of the year a week, or sorry, a month from today. So the first Thursday in December, we'll be back here, same place, same time, talking about energy efficiency as we go into those cold winters. So thank you guys.